Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I'm Jared Counterman, I'm the Associate Director of Student Resources here at CSC Global and with us um, I'll introduce Brian and then Brian will kick it off uh, over to Cody, but um, Brian Hummel is our uh, esports coach um, and runs our program for us. So uh, he was the one that set up today's event. So all the kudos and recognition go to him. And thank you, Cody, for joining us today and taking time to chat with our students and maybe even some alumni. So Brian, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to uh, talk about our esports program here at CSU Global and then also introduce Cody. Awesome. Thank you, Jared. So yeah, we started this well, CSUG started an uh, esports program about two years ago, you know, kind of as a community engagement um, tactic. And then they wanted to get more into the competitive side of things and, you know, brought me in. So, you know, throughout this last year, we've been recruiting some um, current students and incoming students to compete, you know, multiple titles. Um, we've had some people that have, you know, increased in rank in multiple games just from playing with, you know, peer to peers here. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been super great, fantastic, huge community for a fully online college. It's, it's awesome. Um, we've got Cody Dragon here, though. So Cody is a very interesting individual. He, he started his career off in a, in a really crazy way, and I'm sure you'll hear about it today. But, you know, he was one of the founders of Ghost Gaming, and now he's on business development for Kovax. He's been doing this for years and years, and, you know, he's seen both the professional side of the industry, the collegiate side, and everything in between. Um, I'm super excited to have him here. It's, it's pretty rare that you get people like this in front of you to, to talk to you and where you can ask questions. So if anybody has questions, please feel free to, you know, hit them in the chat box below and, you know, Cody will answer them at the end or, you know, he can make it interactive as you want, but, um, you know, thank you so much, Cody, for coming. And I'll, of course. I'll you. Yeah, Brian, thank you again. And Jared and everybody at CSU for, for organizing these things. It's no matter how many times you do them, it's very surreal to take a step back and and to think about you know the work that you're doing and what you've done so far these are always like a good rear view mirror check i'd say um and as like this industry is growing it's i think it's important that we're we're educating peers along the way to make you know to kind of removing barriers of entry so that it's not so you know i think the 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 beauty of esports is it's very democratic in the sense that and horizontal i use that word a lot and i'll i'll try my best to illustrate what i what we talk about here when we, when we use these terms because there's a lot of trends right now in esports e when trying to make it very sports-like, um, and there's there's a couple of things that are wrong with that. So it's always great to get in front of a school. Uh, we work very heavily in the college system. Uh, we think this is the future of esports to some extent. I think it's going to create uh, impact that the East, that the traditional gaming industry couldn't have done on its own. So we tip our hats um, and we want to pay homage back to collegiate systems as best we can and to support students who want to enter the industry. So it's a huge honor to speak to you guys. For you all to take the time out and to hear us prattle on about this amazingly fun industry that we never knew was going to happen, but just a bunch of gamers who love, absolutely love what they do. Um, and they want to build something cool that, that lives on beyond them when they're done with it. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I wanted to make this, you know, super interactive type of chat where people can ask questions and stuff, sure. but you know, for the people that don't know what ghost gaming is or what Kovax sure. is or how you got into it. Maybe you could explain that a little bit. Sure. I, I could start kind of from the origin. I think it's that, you know, I, I'm not one to like kind of wax poetic about, you know, the different business ways and or ways in which you win business. I think if you really love what you do uh, and you're very like convicted in it. Um, and I know that sounds kind of cheesy and, and kind of a trope at this point when it's like, do what you love and love what you do. Right. But the money comes and it's it's funny, you hear it all the time, but it's, it's because it's true. Um, and so I, I'll take it back. You know, I was a lifelong gamer. Right. And so my career is just an evolution of what I always wanted to do as a kid and what I always dreamed I was hopefully going to be doing. So lifelong gamer. I, uh, you know, I was competitive by nature. My dad was, you know, my, my father was a very eccentric man, uh, but a highly competitive one. Um, you know, we were we came from a very, um, you know, musical family really well known so like I was starstruck by my own dang family and that scared the living bejesus out of me um 
And I was always kind of thinking back in my head, like, what am I going to do? Because I saw how much they all loved what they did. They're, you know, they're, Jared, you might know, maybe not, but Captain and Tennille was a group out of the 80s or like a big duet. Any, anywho, it's, uh, it's a little bit before our time, but, you know, I'm an older guy. So to me, it was, it was okay. But, um, you know, I was a lifelong gamer and very, um, a lot of pressure on us to, to do something great. And I was asking myself, what am I going to pick? And I was like eight years old thinking this thing, like, cause I was, I was aware of the family that I was in and it was a little scary to me. And I go, just hold on to gaming. I think you really like this. Just hold on to this thing as long as you can. And we would kind of daydream about it. You know, it's changing the world through esports. What would that look like? You know, we looked at South Korea and once I started to become aware of what esports was, you know, gaming and esports, we all know are two different things. Uh, but it felt like a whole new world when I realized what esports was, and it it, it was very sci-fi to me. Um, and I I think there's an interesting future there. So fast forward, I played Halo. I was competitive. I uh, I did lacrosse, so I was familiar with sports. Um, and I went to travel camps. I did summer leagues. I played varsity. Um, and I was kind of that jock gamer that didn't really talk a lot about his gaming. Um, but I found it to be just as fun, if not more fun. Um, also because it was kind of underground and taboo, I thought it was even more cool that I got to like, kind of stick it to the man and stick it to, I don't want to say stick it to my parents, but they weren't huge supporters, to be honest. Um, and that's also really why I work so hard on youth and collegiate, because I think these are just things to be looking through, um, in a different lens so that we can understand it. And this all segues in, hopefully this is a kaleidoscopic story that will distill it, you know, into why we work and what we do, because it comes in from so many different angles. And this is kind of how careers are made when there is not an industry or a business that exists. It's personal experiences, you know, frustrations with things, and they all come into one and that's your job, you know, after a certain point in time. So yeah, super competitive gamer. Um, and, you know, I remember going to lands and losing, you know, first round, just getting bopped out of, bopped out of bracket. I go, man, but that was fun. So I wanted to go back and I'd scribble notes down and take, you know, I'd draw the maps out and be like, what if there was software? So we'll, we'll talk, well, this is all going to lead somewhere. So I would start to imagine, you know, what if there was software to make gamers better, right? Um, and so fast forward a little bit, I was an e-commerce entrepreneur um, out of college. That was my formal start. I actually tried a very short stint at the age of 20 to throw a, a music concert that 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 flopped amazingly. I mean, it was a 4,000 person venue and I had about 50 people in there. Um, and I go, well, there's nowhere to go but up from here. So, you know, I just knew we were going to be okay. And I was like, you know, I did the music thing because, you know, family was in music and I thought that's what I needed to do. But um, that taught me a lot of lessons. You know, they say it's true. You fail. You learn more than when you win. We, I, I would have thought I was the bee's knees if I would have filled that out. And who knows where I'd be if I stayed in the music industry. Um, so I kind of took a step back and I got into e-commerce. Um, I always thought gamer, gamer brains were sharp because of what we did in the server. So I thought, you know, if I'm so good at games, why can't I go play entrepreneurship? You know, and I, I thought about that. I go, it's just like the same thing. I tried to draw parallels to prepare myself for the, the, the intensity of what was to come. And it was no joke taking a product from zero to something. And we invented a whole new category of a product. Uh, so patents and systems, you know, at 21 years old is, is pretty intimidating. Luckily, I have an awesome, you know, family support system um, who's been through this before and would kind of walk me through these things. And of course, I said, you know, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to listen to you. Like, you know, in true stubborn fashion, um, you know, and, and looking in hindsight, like I should have just listened to them along the way, it would have been a lot easier. Um, and so the e-commerce brand was really kind of at its peak. Um, and I was approached by a very close friend of mine uh, who I went to boarding school with, who was also a big gamer of mine. That's how we made, we became best friends. We played World of Warcraft together and played Halo and we came up together for our love of video games. And he was working at a company that you guys may or may not be aware in Colorado or wherever your students are. Um, the, the company is called Weed Maps. Weed Maps is a marijuana software technology company, essentially the, the Yelp or a, the um, kind of the Google Google Maps or whatever you want to call it of of um, of marijuana dispensaries and delivery services. And they were wanting to get into esports and gaming. And I go, Dominic, you'd be you'd be an idiot if you you didn't take that on. That's that's a no brainer, you know, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and he just kind of fumbled the bag a little bit on it. I go, dude, what are you doing? So I, 
came in and keep in mind, I'm at the peak of my e-commerce. So like, it's really good to go into to opportunities when you already have some, because it's not do or die. I was already on fire with this business at the peak of the money we were making. So when I was doing this, this was just for fun to see if I could get it. Um, and they were blown away. And that was a pretty terrifying moment. I go, oh my God. And my girlfriend at business partner at the time, you know, my significant other, she goes, she looked at me, she goes, Cody, if you want to do this, you can. And I felt free to do it. And because she was my, you know, I can't just, you can't just abandon a business partner. And that was the most like freeing. And also, like I said, terrifying thing that could happen because I had no idea what I was doing, but I think secretly deep down, I had every, I knew exactly what to do. And we'll talk about some of the marketing activations that were just very intuitive to us. And if you do what you love, everything is, is intuitive and you need to get your brain out of the way because you'll overthink everything. And if you just do what you think looks good, if you're a graphic designer, over time, I mean, your stuff is going to be terrible in the beginning, right? Whatever you might do. If you're a copywriter, it's going to be terrible in the beginning. There's a lot of analogies about, you know, dra backed up drain pipes. You got to like let the thing out so the dirty water can get out first and then eventually clear water comes through. And that's the creative process in many ways. And in business, it's no different. You got to get out bad ideas so you can identify this thing sucks. And then you start to draw parallels to why things are good. So you cannot be afraid of putting out bad work in the beginning. If you keep putting out bad work, then, well, there's no way to help you. Eventually, you need to kind of learn your lesson. You know, you kind of, you need to understand that. And there's a lot of feedback now in, in online to understand if your stuff is doing well. People retweets, likes, comments. I mean, those are live feedback uh, if something is picking up and if a community likes it. So rewind back to Weed Maps. I was offered the job and I said, okay, I'm going to do it. Um, you know, I wasn't a huge, I, I wasn't consuming cannabis at the time, you know, dabbled obviously in high school, like every other kid. And I go, I think I have an idea of how to do this. And it's a look very different than I think people expect us to, because this was the age of, you know, team YP was, you know, there was, esports was very different than it was today. And we've gotten luckily some of the bad brands out, I'd say, um, you know, there was, there was porn pornography companies trying to sponsor teams. There were, you know, alcohol companies doing in marketing to minors. And there was a lot of bad actors. And I think people were very much expecting us to, um, to be one of those bad actors who just wasn't going to do this thing right and, and embarrass the whole industry. And I was not going to let that happen. I wasn't going to be embarrassed in the place that I knew best. And these are my people like, so, you know, it was a very intuitive process. So ghost gaming came from, from weed maps as, as I served my time in weed maps, it was a marketing position primarily. Think of Red Bull, esports, Red Bull, motocross, anything like that. So we're doing very similar activations. Um, so and I, Brian, I actually don't want to like go too far outside of this and stop you from asking questions that can help steer me. Like I said, this is a kaleidoscopic process for me to be able to like pull in how things happened and why we're here now, but I can freestyle or if you want to cut me off and back things up, feel free to interject. Okay. Sure. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what happened at Weed Maps because I'm not sure what most of you guys were doing or what you're studying. Um, if you're looking at esports, I'm sure it's, and I want to make any, we see a lot of, you know, we see a lot of marketing. Obviously that's a huge one, right? We're seeing some technology, you know, you know, computer scientists step in. Um, and there's a, there's a lack of that for a lot of reasons. Um, but there are some on the fringes that are, that are supporting competitive teams through things like data science, um, you know, statistical analysis of, 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 of player stats and analytics and drawing interesting parallels and things like that. So, you know, I can imagine you guys are here for a reason. This is a, a very bright horizon right now. I'm, I, we wake up every single day thinking we are actually going to do this. Like we, we have a very deep feeling in our gut that as our company, we, this, this industry is going to happen. Uh, there's no doubt about it. There's a global consensus that esports is going to build out infrastructure around the world, in physical locations with programs that, that, that keep people, you know, we always say butts and seats. How do you keep butts and seats at a venue, right? And colleges are very similar, similar thing. Scholarships, you got to get kids in, you got to get kids butts and seats and uh, learning and playing and representing the school and going on to become great citizens of the earth representing and being an alumni and coming back and doing something great and passing on the torch, right? It's no different than a sports system. So all those amazing things that happen in sports are going to happen in esports, and that's what keeps us excited about about this industry, and we're going to play a role in that process. Really, 
Sorry yes. to interrupt your thought. You just, that was a perfect segue for a question that came in, um, which was from Thomas. He asked, do you believe in the coming years, esports scholarships will be commonplace um, and with most colleges having them among athletic ones? Yes, I, I, yes, is the answer. I think it's happening already. The, uh, I think that the count is up to 16 million a year in scholarships. And I don't know what that compares to traditional sports. Traditional sports have been around for a long, long time and people put their butts in seats in stadiums and buy hot dogs and, and, and they can monetize that, that traffic a little bit easier than they can esports. As I think colleges figure out ways to, to monetize esports, I think it's going to become way more commonplace. And Brian is a, a leader in that, right? Like his program is, you know, one of the most aggressive, you know, scholarship, you know, givers uh, in, in the U.S., right? I mean, to, to, the, to the likes that we don't really see. So, you know, I think it is going to become commonplace as, you know, these teams and players represent schools online. I mean, that's pretty big reach, you know, when they play for Bay State in their bio and they pop it off and they're getting Fortnite clips that are, you know, getting hundreds of thousands of views possibly. That's really good marketing for a school. And this is where young men are, young women and, include, and increasingly women are online, period, obviously, because of COVID was a huge watershed moment. We saw that. But, but the trend is up. I mean, people are spending more time online and they consume content that includes gaming. Twitter, Twitter is a, the primary traffic source for Twitter content is, is, is gaming related. So, you know, high virility online on these social media platforms, gaming content leads the way. If schools can figure out how to put their logos onto those, those moments, they're going to continue investing into that so they can get the word out about their programs for sure. 100%. I'll actually add on to that a little bit too. I mean, if you look about it at it five years ago, right? Collegiate esports was rarely even a thing. You know, maybe yep. there was 10 schools in it, you know, two of them offered scholarships. Now we look at five years later, there's about 400 colleges that are, you know, quote unquote varsity programs. There's about 200 offering scholarships for esports. And, you know, people are building out these massive land centers and arena spaces for millions of dollars. And, you know, the investments there, it's, you know, it's just how soon are these, these bigger colleges going to start investing in it, right? Like we haven't seen, like there was the big 10 and the pac 10 and those types of things that started to get into it, but it died down, you know, in these upcoming years, once, once, you know, Alabama wants to come in and start, you know, building out a 400,000 square foot facility for their students and things like that. That's what you're going to start seeing in these next few years. And of course, you know, right now is the gold rush time. So people are going to start offering these crazy amounts of scholarships and stuff to get butts and butts and seats. Um, I do see that leveling out at some point, you know, there's always going to be those programs that want to be the most competitive and, you know, they'll offer traditional division one athletic scholarship type things, but you know, you'll see those people that are in the middle of the pack that want to be division three, right? They'll set her for the competitive people that might not be the best of the best. Um, and it's, it's pretty interesting to see the collegiate um, ecosystem too, because, you know, professional orgs don't really make money you know there's only a few i'm sure cody will tell you how much money they blew on ghost gaming and stuff <laughs> at some point but you know it, it takes money to make money and yes yeah, scholarships scholarships will definitely be a thing and i actually have a question for you cody how old were you when you got put into that position to lead the oh. chart you know ghost uh, gaming like what yeah what happened? yeah i was i was so so I, like i said it started off as weed maps but weed maps is a company that is sold for about a billion five about a year and a half ago so i was like I said, terrified. Uh, I was probably 22, I'd say, or 23, uh, with very little working experience uh, working at that level. I have always been able to, and this is this kind of goes back to like pick, plant your flag really firmly and just stand by it long enough, and like someone's convicted with you. Like as long as it makes sense. Like we're not talking like this is an abstract art we're talking about here. We're we're really thinking that this thing is going to happen. So the experience was like, they just trusted us because we were pure gamers. We had a vision for a future that was not here yet and they were willing to invest into it. So looking in hindsight, I knew exactly what to do the whole time. It was pretty, pretty unbelievable. <laughs> pretty unbelievable. Yeah, I was very young, very young. So nothing is off the table for you guys right now in esports. I see 15 year old kids getting huge offers. My little brother uh, is a Fortnite player and he, um, he works with an editor located in Mumbai. India. Uh, and, the, and, and his editor is like 13 years old and he makes about $10,000 a month just from editing people's Fortnite clips. So 
that's what I'm saying, wide. It's very horizontal. Like every the, the, the barrier of entry is very low right now. Even in the corporate world, the barrier of entry is fairly low. And with that comes a lot of charlatans, unfortunately. A lot of BSers who can kind of fudge their way through. I love gaming. Okay, cool. What are we building? Well, I th like I said, the, the big consensus is infrastructure, uh, pipelines that produce more than just players, good people on the academic side. And you know, we play on both sides of this. So yes, I was very young, Brian, to answer your question. That's crazy. So I know a couple people in here, you know, how's your work with COVAX and whatnot? Sure. Maybe you can explain what exactly your role is with COVAX and sure. how you're kind of innovating this whole industry now. Sure. Well, it's a continuation of what we were going to do at Ghost Gaming. Um, so the, the big the big business in esports is <laughs> trans. I mean, other than the TSM $210 million naming rights deal, which is probably the biggest thing we've seen. I don't know if none of you guys are familiar with that. I suggest taking a look at what happened with uh, the organization TSM. Um, it is the largest deal to date for an esports organization for about a quarter of a billion dollars over the course of 10 years. Um, it's pretty indicative of where we're at right now. I'd say it's, a, it's a, another big landmark moment in terms of sponsorships and, and, and business development for, for new industries. This is a crypto industry. So, um, you know, some people have their own, their own take on that. We're entering the esports, which is traditionally younger children uh, or, you know, excuse younger men downlines in through Fortnite. I mean, TSM. I haven't looked at their roster in a minute, but I'm sure there's a lot of young, impressionable young adults, right? Uh, so, <clears throat> yes, yes. I think uh, in terms of what COVAX, what we do here now, sorry, it's, it's quite a bit to unpack. We're, we're a startup, right? We're a technology startup that makes the best-selling piece of AIM training software in the world. Uh, we've sold about a million copies of this product online uh, through Steam. It was made by a, a, an individual. Uh, his name is Garrett Cotilla. He goes by Kovacs. He's a very well-known Quake player. Um, and he he dabbled in things like sensitivity conversion. So how do I play Overwatch or whatever it might be? I'm sure Quake at that time or Unreal Tournament. Take my sensitivity from that and then convert it over to another game through things like linear algebra and, and, and other ways. And they started to expand on that concept. And it, it eventually turned into what, what Kovacs Aim Trainer is now. And it's a sandbox. It's a physics sandbox that allows you to train in whatever game that you play. We only service the FPS space. So like I said, like in the, the lacrosse space, we used to go to summer camps and you can practice drills. You can shoot with your right hand, shoot with your left hand. You know, you can pass with a buddy. You can do a one-off and then a two-pass. Drills are bite-sized ways to, to improve your game. In esports, there really isn't that. It's hop in, quick play, scrimmage, let's hope and pray that we can work on those things that we're weak at over and over and over again. Nine times out of 10, you're not gonna see the scenario that you're most weak at, right? And a lot of the times the games themselves don't have tools. Now, some are better than others. Like Counter-Strike is an open system where you can create workshops and players have created aim training courses. And I'm sure you're familiar with some of those. So we expand on that concept quite a bit and apply it to all the FPS titles. So the secret sauce of our software is it's cloned physics from all your favorite FPS titles, Overwatch, Fortnite, Valorant, anything like that. Soon Halo Infinite will be in our software so we can practice our BR shots from three players and shoot, you know, the sky's the limit once you have the physics in your hands, you can kind of create whatever. Uh, and it, because it's a sandbox and it's user generated content, we have over 10,000 different training scenarios that our community has made. So there's a lot to dive into. Um, so with that all being said, this tied in really well to the business that we were trying to build at Ghost Gaming, which is essentially a pipe, right? So there could be the Ghost Gaming brand, you know, the team, the professionals that the kids were looking up to. We signed, you know, 15 to 20 of the top Fortnite players in the world at one point, very well known and things like that. Well, instead of selling t-shirts and jerseys, et cetera, there's an argument to be made that they would, they would wanna come train at a Ghost Gaming facility. Uh, and engage with ghost gaming exercises and drills and uh, you know things of that nature. So we wanted to build out the youth development talent space, um, but there wasn't anything like Kovacs when we were running this. So we we're like, how do we teach? How do we create drills? You know, how do we do this? Because that's what you do when you go to an AYSO camp, right? Uh, or anything like that. Little league, you know, they have drills and little, you know, the coaches get a packet of how to train for the season, and right, that's the concept here. Just a, a scalable training solution for esports that takes in all the FPS titles. FPS is the largest genre in all of esports. It's 
Fortnite, it's Call of Duty, it's Valorant, it's Counter Strike, it's Overwatch. So we cover, you know, 80% of the market with our software, uh, and it allows programs like what you're doing, Brian. Hopefully, one day you'll be able to have summer camps, and it's the base state training packs. So it's Fortnite 101, and you know the branding on the walls, so because you can actually brand inside of our game, and put logos and colors and things on the walls to create this interactive experience for that's a, a bespoke. Uh, experience for for the community that's participating in it. and it reinforces the brand at the same time so that's that's the play here right this is the play and right now we are heavily investing into collegiate and building the relationships all around that because collegiate is going to have all the infrastructure uh throughout the country they're going to have all the esports facilities they're going to have all the coaching staff right they're going to have all the players that are going to want to teach or volunteer at summer camps we have all of our HR needs. We have all of our staffing needs, all of our uh, facility and infrastructure. Um, and they're becoming familiarized with COVAX right now. So we don't have to train them when that day comes, when they want to start building out their, their summer camp programs. We want them to have their jerseys. We think that Little League of Esports is coming. We're going to help build that, that transfer of knowledge because, you know, I would say 90% of top players are still playing professionally. And I say top players relatively loosely, but they're still competing. They're still in this locked away corner of the esports industry. Um, and now it's slowly starting to trickle out. You know, you see some former pro players attending colleges and, you know, the, the osmosis effect of one pro player on a collegiate roster is going to level up that whole roster just immensely in that one area tucked away and, Kansas, right? Now, what do you do with all this talent? Well, there's kids in Kansas who probably play and they might want to go to something because like I said, this goes back to my family not knowing or caring much for gaming and not seeing it. We think on higher education campuses, it's a great place for families to become comfortable with esports because it's higher education. Um, and, and to see the kids in the jerseys with the coaches, you know, it's a big dream we're trying to build. It's just essentially we're building a new world and that's what we go. I don't care how we do it. We're going to do it. You know, we focus on partnerships with strategic partners like yourself, Brian. You know, we work with entire state systems now. We have we have secured one of those with 500,000 students, you know, at the stroke of one pen. So, you know, we have um, we have a, a very, very big job to do. Um, and we're really here to make friends and give people the, the service and the tools they need to hopefully build the collective dream I think everybody has here, which is, you know, a, a responsible esports space for, for kid, you know, for young people and adults who want to, who want to collaborate. Thank you. I've, uh, there's one question in the chat and I think all of us can probably answer this, but it's, do you think that collegiate esports will have big land events in the near future? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's a good one, but I'm yeah. Just... Oh yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt. Esports is better experienced in person. Like everybody knows that, you know, you can, I think people can monetize it more. They build brands better while well, we love online. Like I love online gaming, don't get me wrong, but there's nothing like a LAN. You know that Brian, there's yeah. meeting your friends for the first time that you've played against or played with for years is like, it's pretty magical stuff, you know? So it's yeah, crazy. I, I, I mean, like Cody and I, we'd been talking for over a year now it is. And we just went to a LAN event, met each other for the first time yep. in person a couple of weeks yep. ago, you know, had some drinks and it's just like, I'll never forget. I, I played with a buddy on Xbox for like 15 years. And then I met him at PAX East two years yep. ago for yep. the first time. And I was like, what the hell is this? You know, this is yeah. awesome. But just bringing people together is what esports is about, whether it's remote or in person, you know, but these LAN events are going to get bigger. Yep. Um, you know, I, I already know that there's a few colleges hosting land events. There's one going on in oh, uh, yeah. St. Louis next month. And and then uh, Harrisburg hosts one. You know, it's it's super cool. But um, yeah, I mean, that yeah, that it's is... coming for sure. It's it's coming for sure, because it all goes back to I think everybody's in the business of making esports more exciting and accessible and lands and live events do that. You know, I cannot tell you how many parents I've met who go, you know, I, I, I wanted to learn. So I went to TwitchCon with my son or a daughter or whatever. I went to this tournament with him and I totally see it now. I totally get it. You know, he, it's, it kind of, when we sit in this room and sit behind this computer for so long, I think that's the problem because it's sedentary, right? That's, there's a couple of reasons why esports is never well received by parents and, and rightfully so in my opinion. It's traditionally sedentary by sitting down for so long. It's isolated in terms of, uh, you know, physical interaction with others, right? There's tons of learning that goes on 
uh, with young people that's nonverbal and in a, in a physical location that's extremely important for, for children to develop, right? So sitting in your room playing for, is not good for kids. So parents just want to know that, okay, you can game, man. We just want you to be healthy, you know, in more ways than one, not just physically, socially, you know, all we want you to be able to meet people, interact. When they go to a LAN and they meet their, they, the parents back off. They go, this is awesome. Have fun, man. You know, run, run around go have a good time. So yeah, LANs are really important. They, they're good for the whole industry. Exactly. That, and that's a good answer. And just the whole social aspect too, like land events are going to create that, that gap where parents are now not like so confused at why their kids are gaming, what, you know, mm -hmm. what's going on. This is, you know, this is what they love. It's their mm -hmm. football, it's their soccer that, you know, it's gaming, yep. but um, you know, it really brings people together. Heath day actually has a great question. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll just touch on like, you know, the, the point that you made earlier is, you know, you're able to train people. So essentially Kovacs is one of the first training softwares where you can hone your skills in, in gaming. Right. Yep. So his question is you mentioned training and practice elements. Mm -hmm. What does coaching look like from your perspective? Mm -hmm. And they work with high schools across the state who are trying to get teams up and going, but they have no idea how to coach. Sure. Um, that's a great question. Yeah. You know, how, like yeah. what are the resources and tools and, you know, what <laughs> would you recommend? Yeah. I mean, it's like the business case is just made right there. Right. Because for, like I said, for the first time in a sports history, you've got all the players who know more than really all the coaches pretty much at every level too. Right. So you, you need this, you need this tool and software is the thing that you can do at scale. I mean, we could probably print out a bunch of flyers and say, Hey, here's how you teach FPS and send them out around. That's not, you know, we're in, we're in the digital age here. So that's not the way you do it. So repeat the first part of the question. So I, sorry. So, so what does coaching look like from your yeah. perspective in East? Yep. Well, there's a lot of different, a uh, lot of different types of coaches because it's first gen, right? So like you've got, We've got some coaches who really are, are really high end to understand not just in-game skill. Hold on, is my camera? It's probably my lighting. Hold on, let me move my head over here. Okay. <laughs> God. God. Um, oh, God. Okay, so there's coaching at different levels, right? Like we, we work with, you know, we work with hundreds of colleges right now, and, and there are some that are super advanced and some who are just, you know, TAs or admissions counselors who came over and are, are learning this for the first time. So it just all depends on the program. Um, coaches can be very in-game oriented and mechanics oriented. Some can be more, uh, you know, moral support and keeping the, you know, the, 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 the vibe right on a team is lack of a better word. Um, and, and keep, you know, kind of being removed from the roster without the emotions that the players tend to have amongst themselves. Coaching from our perspective should look like hopefully for those coaches who want it, like any other traditional sport, right? A player development resource and one that can give them a, a you know, a third person's perspective on their player journey and helping them get to where they want to go. Kovacs as a piece of software is an aim trainer, right? And, and we aim wins games. So we focus really heavily on just improving wrist control from a different tons of different types of perspectives right so if you're playing things like valorant that's very click timing oriented and you know whereas opposed to overwatch with a certain character's tracking right you can literally see this all in the wrist when a player is playing you can almost probably just watch a wrist player in a watch and say oh they're a hit scan player or, or oh they're a tracking player i can just tell in the way they're moving their hands so we focus all on that type of stuff and now, we're not a we're not a, a physiotherapy software solution, but that's just what we end up doing is building motor muscles and and the parts of, you know, in developing muscle memory right really really fast. So we think there's a case to be made. Actually, we we know, but we're going to see if the market responds as well as we hope it does. Um, to the ability to train players, you know, test their skill, see where they at, where they where they lie, um, and figure out ways to help them get better and track their progress, right? We, we get a ton of data out of our software that game developers do not give you. If you're playing Overwatch, you're not gonna be able to track your accuracy in the same degree that you are can, you can here. It's just not gonna happen. Um, you know, so we get all the data that Overwatch doesn't wanna make public to you, and we will allow you to track and draw your own correlations and parallels from, so that you as a coach can come up with your own unique strategy, make players better, win more games, get hyped, you know, prove to your program, look, I take, you know, I take players in, I make them better uh, in game. And uh, we're, we're just, we're, we're a great resource for, for, for competitive players. So, and we, and it gives something for coaches to have in the driver's seat. I, I'm really big on giving tools to coaches so that they can kind of own their role and own their job. Because right now, as I saw in my, when I was running ghost gaming, my coaches didn't have a lot to, to, to test players and to watch players performance. 
you know, they don't have the tools that that I think they deserve. So, yeah, Kovax is the problem. It, it solves the problem I had up here at Ghost. So I was one. I should have been one of the first customers on a massive level. Um, you know, not only because as a program you want to win today, but you want to win tomorrow. You want to win in the future. My job. I love my job at Ghost Gaming. I didn't want to be gone in two months, two years, because we had a bad season. I want to know why we had a bad season and what can we do to fix it. So coaches and directors have a very um, you know, 30,000 foot view um, and software will help them, you know, build these, these legacy programs that are hopefully here in 20 years when, when esports is just even bigger than before. Yeah. I'll touch on that too. Uh, Cause I've been working a lot with the, you know, the high school ecosystem and I've seen it all from, you know, the IT instructor that comes in has no clue about what video games, but they know the software to the, to, you know, the, the graduate assistant volunteer from a college who is, you know, a competitive gamer. Right. So in my mind for, for coaches in high school, you know, really the best coach that you can get for them is just a mentor, at least right now, because obviously, you know, not all these teachers are going to have the same gaming knowledge as, as the students, but at least somebody that can be there to be a mentor, help connect them with the colleges, with these, you know, amateur organizations, somebody that's willing to dive deep and learn about esports. So like, like you say, somebody has no background in gaming. It's not hard to learn about gaming, right? You can go sit on Twitch for, you know, 10, 20 hours, watch a bunch of different streamers learn about that game you'll learn about what type of different sponsorships they have how they've gotten them you know and then you'll learn different skill levels right like you'll see somebody half the time they're dead right so you know maybe they're not the best and then somebody that's going on you know a spree right those, those are the types of people and then you know setting different coaches apart right like cody said you know most of the players are, are better skill wise at the game than these coaches right so how do you make a good coach well it's it's understanding the game at a whole different level than just being good at it mechanically right like the whole macro is what we call it and and when you can start diving in it's like a chess match right like i think of league of legends you know i've got some ex-professional players on on some of my rosters and i watch them i'm like these people are nasty right like how am i going to coach them but then i'm going <laughs> over a vod review and i had never played league of legends until i watched them and i'm like wait, maybe I do have some critiques on where they should be. It is, you know, I see this person on that part of the map, you know, why are you doing this? You know, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's ask the questions, you know, if somebody's in that spot, you know, say, what were you thinking at this point? Mm -hmm. Why were you doing that? Um, and then really get to the bottom. It's, it's almost a thinking game. There's, there's a difference between somebody who's going to come in, like you could have a professional coach come in who is the number one player in the world. Right. But they might not, be able to teach some of those things because they can't get that knowledge out there. It's all in their head. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about how you portray it, how you say it. Um, and it, it, there's no good coach, bad coach. It's really how your team can perform under the way you treat them. Right. So like, like I could be a big jerk, like a football coach and yelling and screaming at their faces, but you know, how do they react to that? Right. Or is it more positive reinforcement or is it, you know, they want to know exactly what they did wrong. It's, it's those little things. And then as far as resources or tools that I'd recommend for coaches, you know, really reach out to these professional organizations that are doing things like, like Kovacs or Evil Geniuses or TSM Universities, Cloud9. I mean, they're all diving into the collegiate and youth infrastructures, and they've got packets of how you can start up your program, what the software needs are, um, you know, the whole nine yards, what's the budget, you know, is Discord allowed? And I would say for this, if if you do want to learn the whole gaming industry, jump on Discord and start jumping in these communities and asking questions, Definitely. connect with people. It's it's the easiest thing. I mean, oh, yeah. I get a hundred messages a day from people asking, how do I start my esports program? Yep. Yep. I'll send them, you know, and just go from there. So it's it's really just about, you know, getting in front of the right people and then they'll make it happen. You know, if it's hard for you to start that high school program, there's going to be somebody out there that sees benefit in your program being launched and they'll help you. So yeah. can I'm going to pop and just ask a question to the chat for you guys. What are most of you studying and what what are the goals here for, for you attending this, this seminar? And I'd like to maybe be able to ask and at least offer some 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 words there. So esports management okay just so i can tailor this message a little bit so you guys have something to take away from you know i'm a big proponent i'm a man of you know as much as i can speak on esports truly in our work we are very we speak very little because we love what we do and that's the ultimate takeaway i'm going to offer here from this thing is if you really love what you do 
and if there's that story, like I said, you know, what is it that you're trying to prove? Is it, are you proving someone wrong? Because that can be very powerful. It was for me in the beginning stages of my career. It was me planting a flag and saying, gaming's real mom. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. And that has given me a real career here, guys. So, you know, find that story when, when you might not have an opportunity, because it'll be the biggest driving force in your career. And when it is hard, and you don't have anything and you're in between jobs, I'm telling you, that's the thing that'll keep you going. So, um, I mean, I could leave it with that and then we walk out the door, but that's not very helpful to you guys. Um, so I'd love to know, but esports management card, I'll hop in. I mean, that's a very interesting topic in and of itself, right? Like, you know, we, we managers in the traditional org space are, are traditionally, and I'm, this is just totally the way it works in the tier one space. They're really just coordinators, right? They are coordinating schedules, travel, flights, new equipment, you know, distributing jerseys, things like that, getting player information. That's the general, you know, handler stuff you see with esports team managers, unless you go up a level, which was kind of the esports director at a, an organization. Um, and, and you need to be able to prove that you know how to find talent, develop it, get wins, big wins, right? Like, and I'm sure there'll be a world where organizations will let you start handling a team or an academy program if you can prove yourself. I'd say Overwatch Contenders is an interesting place to operate in um, because they're pretty serious and there's a lot of cheddar at the end of that line because it's the OWL. So, you know, that's an interesting place to pay attention to. Majority of species going to be playing on an esports team or collegiate will go towards business or info tech, okay? Yeah, business is always, I mean, you know, it goes back, I'm such a different type of breed with that. Brian, I'm sure you've got your own. Yeah, I mean, I, I was an international business major, right? I mean, I I just loved games and somehow started a company when I was in my college dorm room, similar to you in your high school, you know, dorm room. It's it all started from there. But I to me, I don't think the specific degree path that you go matters, right? Like you can have computer science skills and then get into a business development type of thing if you know sure. enough about that, right? Like like I'm, I'm sure that there's so many people in the esports industry right now without degrees or, you know, with oh, a degree 100%. in like psychology. Something now totally they're the unrelated, CEO yeah. of this company. 100%. 100%. And, and that's just how it works. It's it's really about putting your mind to it. Getting, yep. getting the and right don't way. underestimate the power of a good network. Do things for people. Um, you know, I know we're going in a lot of directions, guys, but I just want to be able to kind of blast the walls with this stuff. It's the same stuff you see from Gary Vee on Instagram when he's spamming, you know, motivational quotes at you. This is very, very true stuff. You know, do things for people, even when they're not asking for it, you have no plans of being paid and fame or monetarily. I mean, I cannot tell you how many doors I've opened by just seeing someone tweet something and said, hey, we had a gentleman who was struggling with something health wise. And I had, you know, we had CBD oil left over. I said, Hey man, what's your, or your address? We'll send you some just did. And lo and behold, he ended up being one of the teammates of Ninja, the Ninja, uh, you know, Valorant roster at the time. And we were able to get him in conversations with a talent agent because he was like, Hey, you know, boom, 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 you know, just do cool stuff for people. You know, you'll know when, you know, you'll know when something is right and you can be a good person in the world. Esports loves good people, truly. I mean, it's it's a very specific, you know, we all have a very similar journey. We've kind of overcome, uh, you know, a little bit of stress to probably get here because everyone battles, you know, in esports to get here. It's, you know, mom, your dad, your family, your friends, a girlfriend, whatever it might be. So have a bit of empathy and go out of your way and be nice to someone and over deliver. If you're a graphic designer, send off a, a pack, a real, a real logo package to someone, whatever that might be. If you're a manager, Hey, can I help you secure? I might know a sponsor, you know, or, you know, it could be even a local sponsor who knows it starts small, find your local player, right. And say, Hey, I know you're, you know, a local call of duty player. I've got a, you know, a dog wash. I'm not even kidding. This is crazy. This is how this works. No matter how small you get your name going and just that momentum gets you going in a direction. So nothing is too small in esports at the beginning. Uh, and I highly suggest over delivering, even when there's no possibility of a, of an outcome, because it usually does come back and it usually comes back 10 times as big down the line. You go, wow, because of that, this happened. I've seen it in my own life uh, and I'm just blown away by by what luck is. Luck is not luck. It's it's the accumulation of a lot of little things. Um, and when you break in and break through to where you want to be, you go, wow, what a relief, you know? So. 
I love the thing. It's you're an overnight success, 10 years in the making. Yeah, right? Sure, right? Yeah. That, that's what's happening in esports right now. Yep. But I have a question for you. So sure. what are some entry level jobs that, you know, it doesn't really matter the major you went into to college. So some of these people in here probably want to get into the esports industry. Do you have mm-hmm. any ideas of what some type of entry level things are that they can get yeah. into? What, how do you I, look for uh, it? I think multimedia is a great place. I see a lot of support there with graphic designers, video editors, uh, montage makers, you know, the stuff that people were doing on the forum boards, you know, 20 years ago uh, on Halo or MLG forums, that stuff, that stuff works, Twitter header banners. So it looks small, like I said, but it turns into esports organization rebrands and working at creative agencies like AOE Creative and, you know, big time creative agents, you know. So I think multimedia, because I think esports is primarily led with with multimedia. I think that's where brands are built. Um, And it's, you know, it's Photoshop. It's Fortnite graphics that already exists. It's low cost to design things. It's just your time, really, right? You don't have to get a video camera and go shoot. So that's a really hot spot for me. Um, if I was breaking in and I was creative, I would be all over multimedia and just sitting behind Adobe After Effects and Premiere and just hustling for, you know, taking footage from a LAN and repile, you know, recompiling it, you know, making a recap content. Uh, Liquipedia, what do I think about Liquipedia? That makes a lot of money for Team Liquid. That's actually one of their primary revenue drivers. Um, Liquid, Liquid is a beautiful organization, in my opinion. I think they've built, I think they've helped lay the the framework for you know for the esports industry as a whole they're very um they're, they almost act but they're almost they're, they're here for like a higher cause and the fact that they've gotten so much money bought into their vision is beautiful to me it shows that this isn't some cash grab they really want to build out something special and they're making money and they're returning money for investors that's that's a great thing so yeah i, I love Wikipedia. i think more projects like that there's a lot of data. HLTV is another great example, Carter. If you've seen that, that's another great product that just sold for $40 million uh, about a year and a half ago. So I'm sure tons of time went into that, but spike.gg, another interesting uh, you know, resource for Valorant community sprung up overnight. A company could easily sell for a couple of million dollars now within the past, what, six months. So yeah, organizing uh, game data and esports community information all in one that's a great, that's a great play. If you have the time doing player interviews and content podcasts, like, you know, be something, you know? So I guess a question for you is now, if somebody's not in the esports industry, right? Like, you know, yeah. it's, it's a super close tight knit community. It's hard to get in once you're in, you're in sure. right? How do people reach out? Like, how should people connect? I know, you know, you can yeah. say LinkedIn, but like, what is the proper way? You know, I say, let your work do the work for us speaking for you. Yeah. And that sounds really lame because it's like, what about, no, dude, I'm telling you the good stuff, it gets seen it's just the way it works. That's the way Reddit works. That's the way Twitter works. People retweet stuff. That's good. Reddit gets upvoted and then you'll get a contact. That's where people are. They're on those sites. They pay attention to those feeds. You know, if you want to DM me something cool, but what are you, I, you know, we all, we've all got it, Brian. Hey, Cody, I want to ask you a question. Sure. <laughs> yeah fire away you've already wasted five seconds i mean i'm serious like we're busy like you know i i we you you need to make something that makes our life easier simple as that it's not as it's not as um that's the way industries work right that's like you're providing value i'm buying something because it helps me get somewhere so ask yourself how can i be helpful that's the way you should lead And, and sure a portfolio led you know i'm sure i've missed content out there that's incredible right i'm sure i have but the amount of people that we did hire at Ghost Gaming because we saw their work online, you know, we put a lot of money in people's pockets. Um, and we could talk about running an organization. I mean, I have no problem talking about the financials of that business and, and how much we spent and, you know, the structure of it. It was pretty loose and wild, but so is esports. So, um, you know, we, I'd be happy to dive in that if you have any questions, Brian. Yeah, I mean, so... What well, I guess what what were the expenditures for Ghost, right? Like how how much capital did you need? You know, how many content yeah. creators were you bringing on? What is the typical content creator salary? You know, because sure. like, all these contracts are typically behind closed doors, and you know, maybe you give some random numbers and like just to look at like sure. you know maybe somebody that worked under you, what what could be a, a potential salary oh, yeah. that they make? You know, things yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, like my immediate staff working, you know, entry level, I would say, for the most part, like I've talked about, like esports managers, you know, they're very much handlers in the sense that, you know, they're organizing logistics of, of the company, right? Like, you know, someone a little bit more like me on the strategy side and brand building and like, you know, chasing down some, some big player deals and 
work in the negotiations, you obviously can earn a little bit more. Um, I would say an immediate circle for that type of job, you know, my immediate staff that helped me run the organization was probably 40 to 50, right? Right out the gate, you know, which is fine. And to them, that was quite a bit of money for their age and, and what they had done in the space. You know, for us, we ran a shrewd business at times because a lot of the money needed to go towards, um, you know, player salaries. And that's what built a brand. And, you know, clout is a thing. I know it sounds bad, but it can be used in tremendous ways, right? Like by saying you work for someone who's pretty dang well established, you can really elevate your brand, right? Um, and the problem is, is when companies take advantage of that, that's a problem and they're not paying or, you know, drastically underpaying their staff. That's, that's a real problem, but do not be afraid to, to, you know, to work what you think is not a, oh, a six figure job being a team manager is just not going to happen. I don't know. I don't know who is. Um, I'm sure there are some, but it's just not my first happen. one was 30 grand in esports, yeah. right? Like exactly. after my, you know, my good job, but whatever, Absolutely. you know, <laughs> you wanted to do it and help, you know, there's, there's, there's a, there's a high cost, a personal cost of being unhappy. So you should really be looking at, you know, what money is one thing in your overall compensation, believe it or not. It's not your total compensation. If you look at your quality of your life, right? Like, do you love what you do? Okay. Like, are you treated well by the company? Like what kind of environment does the company promote and what's the work culture like? I know that sounds tacky. We're all here for the money. It'll make your days so much more enjoyable when you work with good people and a great boss. That's that's worth a lot of money, um, you know, peace of mind. So, you know, hopefully we were able to give that to our players. We gave them an incredible lifestyle, right? Because of it. I mean, we'll talk a little bit about some of the more crazy war stories that we did uh, when we were being wild because weed maps was a wild company and we had a lot of money so essentially the way we can break it down to the viewers who aren't aware hopefully we're able to tie the two together uh, weed maps as a company <laughs> owned ghost gaming because we could not have and i didn't do a great enough job of telling you that but essentially the way it pivoted was from team weed maps we could not have we tried and tried and tried and just couldn't get through so i proposed ghost gaming ghost gaming was team weed maps essentially vice versa um, owned by entirely by weed maps so we had a tr tremendous amount of capital to play with we were probably spending anywhere from 200 to 300 thousand dollars a month at times um on a on a on a, on a good good you know, buy spree. I think at the end, we're probably closer to $500,000 a month at least. So, you know, when we got started, it was a very, very, um, you know, we're paying good salaries. And I made a lot of enemies by paying good salaries uh, because, you know, esports was getting away with not paying players anything. And I don't blame them. It's an underdeveloped space. Game developers don't give a lot of tools to teams to make money. You know, they're not giving them a percentage of the ticket cut at the door, you know, when they host a LAN. Right. They're not doing that. They're not paying the players uh, uh, appearance fees. So there's nothing there. You know, skins are one thing. And that's just a fairly new thing. Team skins. That's a fairly new thing. So, yeah, they don't need to pay these guys a lot of money. They don't, they don't, they're, they're all in it together. And then I come in and I'm spending four or five thousand dollars a player per month. And on a Gears of War team, when these kids are used to getting paid, you know, a thousand dollars a month at the highest end. Yeah, we were bad guys. Like and we were getting calls from game developers saying, hey, what the heck are you doing? And that was an interesting, I go, Hey, these are full-time players and they deserve a full-time salary. You know, she goes, okay. And we were the team to play for because we, we spent the most and we, we treated our players like royalty. So we're a bit of an anomaly, right? That in the fact that we didn't have to do traditional sales for, for an organization. Uh, we did some sponsorship. Sure. We did. We didn't have to though. We were sponsored by weed maps. So, you know, for us, this is a lost leader, um, in the sense in a, in a, in a subtle marketing channel for us to, to eventually build up a brand and then slap a weed maps logo on it when it was done. And that's, that's the marketing play. We're our own marketing and our own brand at the same time. So kind of an interesting combination. And we played on both sides at the same time. So we're, we're playing 3d chess over here, man. We're, 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 we're playing, we're playing the whole, the whole field at the same time. It was, it was awesome. So, um, you know, on a player side, like I said, it depends on the games. We were known for paying really healthy, healthy wages because we want our players to give full time time to the game. I didn't want them to have to work a second job. You know, that's obvious. Um, you know, we, we performed at games like Rocket League. You know, if you're a professional player there, we're playing somewhere right close to $10,000 a month, three, three people on a roster. So, you know, you can do the math, but we're making probably $30,000 a month in skin sales. So it can almost clear itself out pretty well. Content creators. I, at my time, was not huge on content creation as an esports organization. Um, I wanted to lead with esports, right? So 
I wanted to be known for our competitive placements. And, and there are some teams that are separate. You know, Hastro says we want to win trophies, not sell T-shirts. Uh, and, and then Nate Shots laugh into the bank. So, you know, it depends on how you position your company, right? Are you a media company with a, with a twist of esports or are you an esports company with a twist of media? I, you know, it's, it's whatever. We prefer to be on the competition side. Um, I think, I think media and content creation it comes and goes and people go out of style and, but competition will always remain. And I think people will always want to be competitive and they'll always respect high performing players. Like it's hard to go out of style when you're winning everything. <laughs> That's the way we sold it. You know, you're, when you're, you can sell a ton of hats when you're getting first place. So like, let's just do that and figure that code out. That's kind of like a strawless, you know, that, that brand in Counter-Strike is synonymous with excellence and, uh, and they sell a ton of, a ton of merch. So um, you know, so yeah, like I said, we're spending months, you know, I don't know if, if for those who want to see it, I can show you the house. I mean, it might be kind of fun to show the, so the chat, the house we were renting out. Should I, should I post Yeah, that'd chat? be pretty cool. That'd you guys want to cool. see the, you guys want to see the gaming house that we rented out. It was pretty unbelievable. And I'm sure you guys are aware of it now, but I'm going to post in the chat. You also had people like Aiden, like these big oh, Fortnite yeah. stars and, and, you know, I don't think these people realize that you were the one bringing on all these talent acquisitions too. It wasn't somebody else. It was no, no, we no, we worked with the team. I had a, I did have a team. I can't take all credit for for sourcing. I was really big on finding the right people and putting them and getting the hell out of the way. That was my thing because I had to run 35, 40 players. I played on the weed map side. You know, I was, you know, we're we're we would kind of build it, get out of the way, let them run their business, and keep building the next thing. So. You know, that's where the imposter syndrome comes in because you're not really ever present, right? You're always building something new, right? Yeah, that is. Um, that's a baller house. I wish I had 16 fun. bathrooms. <laughs> it was pretty. It was pretty obnoxious. So it's been used by a lot of teams, right? I think Phase Clan is now in it. Yeah. What's funny is I just got an email from the Spectrum Internet people for this house, and I'm tagged in an email with a Phase Clan guy. So I know Phase is in there now because <laughs> nice. I'm getting I'm getting emails about the internet bill. Um, but yeah, I had the master bedroom. I mean, our teams are all up in here just styling. So, you know, we, and we, and we paid them handsomely. So we, we practiced out of this house. We had personal trainers, um, personal chefs. I mean, it was pretty, uh, pretty obnoxious. I will, uh, send you a video if you guys care to watch it. Uh, this is a story done on us by Bloomberg, um, which is pretty fun too. So feel free to take a look at that in your free time. Awesome. Um, and it's the story about ghost gaming as the life of a pro gamer. We developed that program for them, you know, life of a pro gamer. We, we wanted to have the health and wellness. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was a crazy time, man. It was a ton of fun. I can't tell you, I can't tell you, no, it was a ton of fun. I bet. I mean, imagine being 22, 23, yeah. 24 at this time. I mean, I could only imagine there's yeah. one last question in this chat. You know, sure. we got a couple of minutes left. Um, sure. from Jacob Sheehan, do you think free to play helps or harms esports more? It totally helps. It opens up the scene tremendously. The LTV of, of, of players is about, you know, it's, it's much, much higher than just one who buys a single sale copy of a game. If you can get it to a free to play and a subscription based model or a, a skin based model with DLC content, you end up making way more money as a developer. So lifetime value, uh, LTV, great question. LTV, it's a lifetime value of a customer. So, so free to play, I mean, Fortnite makes you know, they're extremely profitable, obviously. Um, the LTV of a customer is how, how valuable is a customer as long as they're with your business. So how valuable is the LTV of a 13 year old who uses their mom credit card on Fortnite? It's actually tremendously high, right? <laughs> because she's just get your skins and get out of my face. And he's like, okay, you know, $3 every couple, you know, a month or so to a parent is much easier than the sticker shock of a $60 game at once. Right. So <laughs> it's a it's an interesting model you kind of piecemeal out but yes free to play has been tremendously important for esports um, and gaming as a whole um, and some people argue that games should be way more than sixty dollars and and to me i kind of as a bias sorry i'm just talking my shoe i'm a bit biased in games i think they're very engaged i think they're one of the most engaging forms of multimedia period i think i think games should be a lot more expensive to be honest i think they're val much more valuable than sixty dollars so but free to play is, is awesome as well i'll take it yeah. Yeah. I mean, skin sales, all that, like clash of clans probably has like 5,000 oh of my dollars over the last 10 years. Yeah. So, I the mean, whales. they make money. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. um, I actually, this is a good question to probably yeah. end it off on. Cool. So I said it to you, but as an owner of an amateur esports organization who operates with an extremely low amount of yeah. capital and is looking to venture into the semi-pro scene, 
uh, and professional scene. What are the best ways that smaller orgs can acquire capital? And what are some tips slash things to look out for? Yep. These so fa so phase clan was where you were, right? Just remember that. Just remember that. So if may probably go back, if you really want to get specific, go back to their archives and watch what they did. Don't hear it from me because I was never small. And it sounds like not to be rude, but I hopped in with a tremendous budget right off the gate. Um, I think there's ways to be super creative through affiliate codes and the grind. You know, if you're in a position where you're 15, 16, which I'm sure you're not, unfortunately, but when you're really young, you have someone sponsoring your business, they got a head start when they could take a risk. Their parents were paying for everything. So like, hey guys, let's get together and let's sell some G Fuel, get you know 10% cut back. That 10% probably grew to 20, 20 grew to 30. Who knows what they're at right now? You just turned 17. You're in the best time of your life to do this, man. So I would get a good group of players together, say, look, dude, you and I, like, let's ride. Let's make a blood pact, okay? Let's do this. And we're going to ride this thing out. So we're going to make content. We're going to do a house. We're going to film everything, grow a brand. Don't overthink it. Go back to the original Optic Gaming videos, you know, grab a pizza, grab the buddies and say, look, let's just do it, guys. And you'll find the ways in which they did it. They did it through, commi you know, commission sales in the beginning that grows, your content gets better. You can start investing into cool things, you know, make a logo that you like and then blow that logo up as big as you can. Don't even worry about the money for yourself. Blow that logo up. That's the way to attract capital. Okay. <laughs> it's build something. So I, I know that sounds kind of counterproductive. Well, how do I build something if I don't have capital? That argument is slowly shifting away in an online multimedia landscape. So Adobe After Effects, Photoshop, your phone camera is insane on your iPhone. I'm sure we have a smartphone, like go out, go kill it, go crush it, build a logo and, uh, and money comes, I guarantee it. hundred percent. Yeah. I saw a small org recently. They created one of the largest like, um, community stream teams, right? They had like 300 different streamers for That's them. They would, they would all watch each other. Right. And then they're getting the ad revenue off of that. And then they put oh. it back into their org. Yep. There's a theory that, that yeah. yeah, there's a theory that YouTube, if all of YouTube creators get banded together, they could all make themselves millionaires. Yeah. Like if uh -huh. every YouTuber in the world all want, we could all make each other millionaires at a pretty quick rate. Yeah. It's just little things like that. Think, think outside yeah. the box too. And you know, yeah. maybe you'll make it. Yeah. That's no, tough. I, and I, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm not to be like hands off with the answer, Aiden. I, I don't want that to kind of like dip out on you. I, I want this to be a genuine answer. I just think there's a lot of companies who will work with you and allow you to be performance based, meaning you go out, you sell some of the merch, keep it, you hold it, invest that into something new, you know, don't be overly aggressive, you know, but don't be timid with what you're doing, invest into the things that are, that are producing outcomes for you. You know, I wouldn't pivot around too many times to different ways. I think merchandise can be done fairly cheaply now, but the problem is that's why I say blow a logo up because if your logo doesn't mean anything, I'm not buying your t-shirt. Why am I buying your logo? What have you done with this logo? What does this logo mean? You know, does it represent like a brotherhood? Is that what you are known for? Is it the open community of esports? What are you known for? Why? And what's your story? What's your story? What's your why? You know, what's the angle that you're going to pick? You know, and that's why I'm just super on this youth space because this goes back to my why. I wanted to have summer camps for gamers, for all the kids. I just, I wanted that. I wanted coaches there who were engaged that I could learn from. You know, I, and I wanted to be a coach too and to be able to talk to the kid and be like, dude, we're going to, you know, and just have that environment. Cause I remember that from sports and it just blew my mind. I remember some of my, you know, my young coaches at basketball camps and all the time, those are the coolest dudes I ever looked up to, you know? And if I could have that through the lens of esports, that's just a home run to me. So, you know, if I can create that world, my job is done here. So that's my why. If you can figure out your why, you just go bang out that logo. Uh, merch is coming, Drake. We've got merch on the way. Don't you worry. I just sent out the contract today. <laughs> <laughs> but we're working on it right now. So yeah, there we'll have a we'll have a licensing partner here. Hopefully soon, we'll we get all the goodies. And uh, you know, we're we're heavily involved in the collegiate space. So don't forget to follow us on at Kovax. Um, and if you care to follow me, talk anymore. It's at Cody underscore Dragon. But awesome. And are these people able to connect with you on LinkedIn? Possibly if they. Oh ever? yeah, yeah. Cody Dragon yeah. on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free. I mean, I, I answer questions, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I try my best to, to give as much time as possible um, 
to, to each and every question. So if you want to, to reach out and ask anything about the esports industry or, you know, how this relates as to what we're doing right now, uh, feel free. I'm, I'm here and we're, we're working right now. Yep. And for um, Heath Day, I, I would highly recommend reaching out to Cody. He might be able to help you set up something at the high school level. So, oh, yeah, please do. Uh, you know, and uh, yeah, that's a little bit over six o'clock Eastern, four o'clock Mountain Time. Um, so, you know, that's pretty much it for this. But, cool. you know, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, Cody, thank you so much. We appreciate it. And Jared, help thank you. the whole thing. Um, thank you all so much for coming out. Yeah. Thank you guys for tuning in. It's always, like I said, a huge pleasure and honor. So, and Jared, thank you to CSU. Thank you very yeah. much for having us. Thanks for joining us, Cody. It was great. So awesome. Have a good evening, everybody. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.